All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Janik Garayeb, and I'm the Senior Health Education and Engagement Specialist with Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Um, thank you for your patience. This is a new platform that we're using this year. So those of you who have attended our webinars in the past, uh, you'll note that uh, we're now using Zoom webinar. And um, I'm just going to go through a few logistical things before we get started with Dr. Seigel's presentation and Jody. So welcome to the very, very first uh, webinars of the 2021 Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada webinar series. As I said, my name is Janik, and I've been with the foundation now for over um, um, 10 years now. And um, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Our mission is to reach every Canadian affected by a brain tumor through support, information, education, and, um, so, and research. Those are really the four pillars of our organization. And this webinar series is just about one educational information program that we are offering virtually. Of course, like everybody else, we've pivoted since the beginning of the pandemic to offer more and more virtual uh, programs through, um, through our website. So our website is braintumor.ca, tumor spelled O-U-R in Canada. Um, and even though our offices are closed to the general public uh, during the pandemic. We are here for you through phone, video chat, and email as well. Um, and so before we get started and before I introduce uh, Dr. Sagal and do a couple poll questions with everybody, for those of you who have, as I mentioned, who have attended the webinars before, in the past we used a platform called GoToWebinar. We're now using Zoom Webinar. All same rules apply in the sense that um, You've all been muted except myself and the presenters. Uh, there are two options at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a Q&A and a chat. If you could please use the Q&A section for questions that you have for Dr. Sagal and Jody. If there are issues with tech or anything like that, or you have a question for me personally, you can include that in the chat section. But including your question in the Q&A section allows me as the host, just keeps me a little bit organized to make sure I don't miss any questions. Um, we are recording the, the webinar, so it will be uploaded to our website within a week or so. And um, yeah, let's get started with just a couple of poll questions. So for those of you who are online, if you could take a second to look at the screen, are you, who's online with us? Are you a patient or survivor, a primary caregiver, a family member or friend, a healthcare professional, or a volunteer for Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada? Let's give you a second to answer that. We've got a good mix of people here with us today, Arjun. So it looks like, I'll give you guys another second. People are still voting. Okay, perfect. So the results there is that we have about 30% or so are patient survivors, 5% are caregivers. 42% are family members or friends. We have about uh, close to 20% are healthcare professionals. And then we have some volunteers for Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Perfect. And just one other quick question to everybody. Um, how did you hear about uh, the webinar today? And I'm gonna guess that the majority of you probably heard it through a Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada communication email or newsletter. That's usually the highest number for us. This is a little poll for our marketing team because I always like to know how you're hearing about us. Perfect. And 51%, uh, more than 50% of you heard about it through the email and newsletters. Perfect. Thank you very much. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, Arjun, while I introduce you, I'm going to make you co-host co so you can share your screen. Give me one second here. I'll just get, have you um, mute yourself for now, Arjun. Perfect. Okay, well, let's get started uh, and uh, introducing Dr. Sagal today. Um, actually, before I introduce Dr. Sagal, I just want to mention for those of you who have been on our um, on our webinar in the past, we've only ever had just one presenter typically, but this year we're going to have two presenters per webinar. So one that's focused on education around treatment and research or quality of life topics. And then the second presenter is always going to be a personal story of hope uh, presentation. So to start us off, uh, Dr. Arjun Sagal is an international clinical and research leader in the field of high precision stereotactic radiation to the brain and spine for both metastases and primary tumors. Trained at the University of Toronto in radiation oncology, he completed a radiosurgery fellowship at the University of California in San Francisco. 
Dr. Sagel has published as lead or as a contributor to over 400 peer-reviewed papers, including high-impact journals, such as the Journal of Clinical Oncology, Lancet Oncology, and the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Sagel is currently the lead, uh, the Sunny, is the lead of the Sunnybrook Odette CNS Neuro-Oncology Program. Awarded a total of $42.5 million in funding since his leadership. Currently, he serves as the Deputy Chief of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Toronto, affiliated with Sunnybrook, Hosp Sunnybrook Odette Cancer Center. In addition, he is the director of the Sunnybrook Cancer Ablation Therapy Program, which involved the installation of the MR Brachytherapy Suite, the MR Linac, and the Gamma Knife Icon technology. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Sagel for over a decade now. Holy moly, Arjun. Um, and um, I have to say, you've always been always you've always been willing to jump on, to give a presentation, to help out with a resource, to um, present at an event for us. So we thank you again for joining us today. And I also want to mention that Dr. Sagel is the very first healthcare professional here in Canada who's received a healthcare professional award from us at Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada just this past November. So congrats on that, uh, that award. And um, Dr. Sagel's presentation, as you can see by the title here, is MR Linac for Brain Tumors from Inception to Clinical Reality. So thank you, Arjun, for joining us today. And I'll just let you take it over from here. Well, wonderful. And thank you very much for the introduction and, and for the Healthcare Professional Award. That was an especially touching event uh, for me and my family. Uh, so thank you for that. And it's a real great pleasure to talk to you about the MR Linac for brain tumors, uh, because it really is a story of bringing a novel technology for our patients uh, with brain tumors. So they don't get ignored amongst the mix of all the cancers that could be treated on novel technology. We really have um, uh, made an effort to bring this for patients with brain tumors. So what is the MR Linac? Well, first of all, what it is, is for the first time, we've been able to integrate a high field strength MRI like you would normally get for your normal diagnostic imaging and getting an MRI of the brain. But now we can actually get the MRI each day while we're delivering the radiation. So we have merged the technology of a linear accelerator with an MRI. And this represents really a feat in radiation technology and just medical engineering that we've been able to do this. So it really is a, uh, a novel device uh, for patients with cancer needing radiation. But who are we, you know, and how did this, uh, did this come about? And it really came about as a result of the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands that built the prototype. And then in collaboration with the vendor Electa, they uh, formed and they decided to take this uh, product, develop it and bring it to market. But it didn't happen on its own. And it happened with this global MR Linux consortium. So there are various centers from around the world, including the MD Anderson in Texas, uh, Netherlands Cancer Institute, Madison in the United States, the Royal Mars in the Christie in the UK, and Sunnybrook as the only Canadian uh, site that was involved in the genesis uh, of the technology. And our role, because we're known as global experts in the treatment of brain tumors, was to develop it for the central nervous system. And all of these different organizations had a key site that they wanted to develop. And certainly for me uh, and my team here, it was about brain tumors. So what's our journey look like? Well, in 2013, we joined the as a founding member of the MR Linac Consortium. We did a lot of work in terms of understanding the technology, the limitations, and how to actually make it happen. And ultimately, the first units were made. And this resulted in a lot of construction. And I spent just as much time treating patients as in the construction uh, site uh, because it was a new thing that we had to make sure went smoothly. And together, we eventually in 2017 developed, delivered the gantry, which is this huge piece of steel that went through the ceiling of the Odette Cancer Center, and then did the testing. Ultimately, we got the clinical system, we had imaged the first patient, Health Canada approval, and in August 2019, I'm proud to say, we treated the first patient who was a patient with a glioblastoma. Now, when you talk about developing a new technology, you have to have a framework because you just don't want to go off without a plan. And we actually developed a plan through the consortium of different stages of technology assessment 
that brings it to the clinic? And how do we make this an actual treatment for all patients with brain tumors in the future? Well, this is the roadmap that we go to systematically evaluate the technology so that we make sure that a new technology such as the MR Linac actually benefits patients with brain tumors because it may not be something that we need to do and it is an extra, not all patients can be treated with it. And our goal was to make sure that if we are gonna go through CNS uh, tumors as an application, to do it in a smart way and study it systematically. So I'm gonna show you some of that roadmap and all the work that we've done because we've treated now almost 140 patients. Well, when you look at the MR Linac program, it involves several steps from the treatment planning evaluation to the imaging, to only using MRI now instead of a CT and adaptive planning. But ultimately we want to get onto a clinical protocol that will change the future of radiation uh, applications for patients. So what were some of the fundamental first steps? Well, one of the fundamental first steps and the reason why it took so long to get an MR Linac or to deliver radiation in the magnetic field is what we are all worried about is this effect called the electron reverse effect. So if you can see here in the top with a B off, these red lines are the electrons going through the tissue. Now, what happens is when you turn the magnetic field on, which is called B on, you see this curling that happens in those little red squiggly lines, and that's called the electron reverse effect. And what it does, if you look at the bottom and this beam's eye view of a dose map, is it blurs it. And, and on, these, on the graphs on your left are some of the effects of the uh, electron reverse effect, which you can see at the end, this peak goes up. And everybody was worried about this because it's an uncertainty. And in radiation oncology, we do not like uncertainty. But can this effect be mitigated? And as computational power increases, can we model this and make it safe to deliver? So some of the initial work was actually done by my fellow at the time, Eric Sang, who's now on staff with me. And I said, you know what, go learn this in Utrecht and figure it out for brain tumors because they were really the pioneers of the technology. And he went there as part of his fellowship. And we did some work in terms of understanding the ability to treat a brain lesion with the MR Linux. And what we found was really by the software being so good now, we can mitigate that effect of the electron reverse effect, understand it, and then account for it. So, so it's not as much of a clinical issue. And where we were worried about it was in air cavities and the skin. And again, by modeling the data uh, and coming up with software solutions, it's not really much of an issue. So this provided the evidence for us to say, okay, well, we're, we think we're gonna be okay and we're gonna be safe and we have a framework. But where do we want to test it in? And really what we need to test it in is patients with glioblastoma. Because as you know, or, or as many of you have experienced, the standard of care is still temozolomide with radiation. And really there's been no advance since the pioneering papers now more than a decade ago, which proved the benefit of temozolomide. But as a radiation oncologist, because you know we're delivering that initial six weeks of radiation and getting you through a very tough time of treatment, is that we really were in the dark. We have an MRI that we do at baseline at the time of planning, and then we do it you know, about a month or two after the radiation's been done. And for those of you who've gone through the process, you ask, well, how's it going? And we're like, oh, I would think you're doing okay. But we never had any objective um, uh, imaging data to say, oh, your treatment's going all right. Things are going okay. Let's reduce the dexamethasone. The tumor's getting smaller. Oh, no, the tumor may be getting a little bit bigger and maybe that's inflammation. And as patients, you know, this is, this is an aspect of the treatment delivery that you're demanding and we could not give that to you, but now we can. So it started out with actually starting to image patients during treatment. And there was only a handful of uh, centers around the world that have really investigated doing uh, MRIs during radiation. So with Sten Meyerhog, who's one of also my um, uh, faculty here in my group as a radiation oncologist, we started looking at day 10 and day 20 MRIs in addition to the one month. So you get a baseline, you get about a third the way through, you get an MRI, two thirds the way through, you get an MRI, and then after. And you're going through standard treatment in terms of the linear accelerator. So we wanted to see, well, is there an actual benefit to trying MR Linac therapy? Because if the tumor doesn't migrate or if everything stays stable, 
well, then there's probably no point because the head doesn't move as opposed to a prostate or a pancreas where it's always moving. And maybe that's where the money is for an MRI LINAC. But what we observed here was eye-opening. So what you can see here in this graph or in this image of the brain tumor in the white is the, is the baseline kind of area that we need to zap. And then what we see at day 10 and day 20, you can see that tumor is migrating and changing and actually migrating to the other side of the brain. And we're adapting now and changing the radiation map to account for this that we would have never otherwise known. And in the bottom, what you can see here is there are different quadrants of changes. So the volume can increase, but it can stay stable. The volume can decrease and stay stable, or there can be a combination of of migration of the tumor, say to the other side of the brain with different volume changes. So in actuality, about 30 to 40% time, we're now making a clinical decision based on these data uh, in terms of reducing medications, adjusting medications, or even changing the radiation map. So this was eye-opening data that we published on almost, I think about uh, 61 patients with full-blown imaging capacity. And this is one of the largest series in the literature. So now we've shown, okay, we, we, we can certainly take you offline and take you into an MR and do the imaging and perform the analysis and change, but our aim is actually to look at daily images. So what are those daily images going to look like? Because the MR Linac MR is not the same, because don't forget, it actually has a linear accelerator in it. So, so that changes some of the properties of the MRI. And we started first with some voluntary imaging. So once we got it in here, some patients of ours kindly agreed to go into the MR Linac and get some images while we were doing a lot of that fundamental work before it got Health Canada approved. And we saw that the image quality was very nice. And we started acquiring different images and we were very comfortable with that. And in fact, we have two scientists dedicated to improving the images on the MR Linac because it's a brand new MRI for the world. So this is an example now of a patient who actually went through weekly imaging. And you can see here, things are okay. And then what you'll see is a bright white uh, flash and then things are kind of changing and adjusting. And that was a little bit of hemorrhage that we would not otherwise have known. So we're learning we're, and we continue to learn. So now that we've been able to do some imaging on the MR Linac, we've got weekly imaging, we're happy with it. Now we have to think about how we're gonna treat the patient because we're still waiting for Health Canada approval. So now we're developing our workflows and it's all about workflows. How are we gonna make sure that when you come for your treatment or your loved one comes for your treatment, everything goes smoothly and there's no guessing games in radiation oncology. I mean, radiation is serious business. It's a, it's a treatment that we cannot take back and it can cause harm. So we've been working on these workflows. So patients come in for your regular CT scan, you get your MRI. How are we going to draw or contour the volume that we want? And then what is the radiation map going to look like? And then every day when you go through treatment, how are we going to evaluate to make sure that that radiation is being delivered with the same accuracy and precision as normal. So we've made through those workflows and we published these workflows so that people can adopt them and we can take the patient ultimately on to treatment. So one of those steps also was actually looking at a new treatment planning system. So this is, this is a very different way for us to evaluate and, and to understand the radiation that's being delivered. And one of the beauties of the MR Linac is the treatment planning system is one of the most sophisticated dose calculation algorithms that are out there. And basically what that means is that it models the actual impact of the radiation better than we knew before. And it's just different. So in the old way of doing things, Things, which was the pinnacle, we can see things are very nice and smooth. And then with the extra information that we learn by using the MR Linux software and that increase in the ability to know exactly what's happening at the electron. So right at the fundamental level of the dose deposition, we started seeing a little bit of differences and some different um, areas of radiation delivery, which are a little bit concerning for us because we weren't used to it. Now it's all safe, but it's just not the way that we were used to it. So we had to understand this and we've been doing treatment planning studies, but eventually we understood it and we're comfortable it and we can go going. And my new fellow actually is actually looking at this in a systematic way to publish these data because it is different. And with every advance, we see differences.
So now we have the patient onto treatment. So now this is a brand new world for us. So we're actually getting imaging every day. And these are some images during the course of treatment where we get our normal T1. Now, for those of you who are, are familiar with uh, MRIs and going through this process, we don't give the dye because we're not gonna give the dye every day. So we are certainly dependent on the non-dye images, but the flare that tells you the swelling of the brain, we can monitor without dye. And you can see here are some beautiful, nice responses with less swelling of the brain as time goes on. And we can do some functional imaging. So now looking at the cellular makeup of the tumor, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but there is real uh, potential for us to understand the biology of what's happening to tumors and feedback to the patients such as yourselves. But one of the challenges when you have all this data and images is that we actually have to be able to get the information out of the image in the area that we want. So while we spend all that time drawing exactly where we want the radiation to go, we can't do that every day. I mean, it takes us hours to do this. So we can't do it for 30 treatments per patient. That's an enormous amount of workload. But luckily, computing software is able now to do a lot of the work for us. And this is what we call counter propagation. So again, evaluating the software to automatically take what we did and put it on each new MRI so that we can extract the information. And we saw here really reliability of the software software in order to do this in the brain tumor patients. And now we're able to do very sophisticated ways of what we call counter propagation. And we do see some differences, you know, when we, when we see from day to day, just because of the difference in position, that the fact that we can now adjust on a day to day basis is making things even safer for delivery. So we understand better what's happening day to day in the radiation delivery, so that we know that we're always hitting the target, but also safely. So this is just an example of some of the variation that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day business, in a day-to-day -day basis in terms of some of the dose points. Now, most of it all hover around zero, but you could see some increases or differences in the actual dose delivered on each day. And these differences were initially somewhat alarming for us because we are not used to understanding this information. But what was good about this when we did the what we call dose accumulation is that we uh, we're able to see that it all kind of smoothens out. And by the end of the treatment, it is pretty much exactly what we expected. So those little minor variations are really not impacting the overall delivery when you take into account the full six weeks of radiation that's delivered. And this is an example of the reference plan, which you can see here on your top left, variation at day four, day 11. But by the end of it, when you sum all the radiation per day, it actually looks really quite beautiful in terms of what we're delivering and pretty much exactly what we expect. So again, more reassurance and better understanding of what we're doing. So in terms of treatment, I mean, this is just telling us that what we've been doing for years is great. What we can do with the MRLINAC in terms of treatment planning is safe, but we do need to move further into the future. And this is where we come into advanced imaging and, this, and, and also metabolic imaging. And we'll talk about this as well, because one of the big uh, research domains that we have here is called chemical exchange saturation transfer imaging. And we're lucky to have the Sunnybrook Research Institute, which is one of the most premier imaging institutes in the world, actually developing advanced metabolic sequences. So actually looking at the metabolism of the tumor. And we've been able to find in brain metastases, which was first, so that's when cancer is spread say from the lung to the liver, and then we're trying to treat these individual areas in the brain, that we've been able to segregate responders from non-responders. So based on the molecular information of the tumor, we can tell you how you're gonna do and what that further follow-up imaging likely reflects, which is tumor response or tumor progression. But we wanted to apply this to glioblastoma because as you know, it, this is very different. We're talking about six weeks of radiation and we have to make sure that what we're doing is, is a value so that over time during those six weeks, we are seeing response because if you're not responding, then we should switch the gears and do something else, maybe different chemotherapy, maybe different surgery. But the first step is to understand because going through that six weeks is so tough for you guys uh, and our patients and we get you through treatment but you want to make sure that you're going through it for value. And there are some patients where you will see 
progression early on. And how do we know who that is? Well, this is some type of imaging that's going to tell us, and, and our preliminary data were published showing that we can actually determine progressors from non-progressors very early on during treatment. Now, another form of metabolic imaging is called magnetic transferase. So again, interrogating the biology of the tumor. And again, we're seeing some responses. And again, these are on our normal MRIs. And we need to translate this actually to the MR linux. Now, one of the challenges that we had was that most of those very advanced images are done on a three Tesla MRI. So that's a very strong strength MRI that really pounds the brain in terms of the magnetic field to get the information. But almost everything we do is on a 1.5 Tesla MRI, and that's the same strength as the MR Linux. Now, our MR SIM, so we actually have a dedicated MRI to image brain tumor patients for treatment planning. Well, we had to actually figure out how we were going to do all that advanced imaging on a 1.5 Tesla MRI. So Angus Lau and Rachel Chan, our scientists that are working the program, actually took apart the MRI, fiddled with the electronics, did some patching, and lo and behold, even though it was a bit risky and they warned us, uh, you know, the cancer center may blow up, just kidding. Uh, we were able to actually adopt functional imaging on a 1.5 Tesla MRI. So that's the first step. And that's a big step. And we published that, that actual ability uh, in a very prestigious journal because this is the first of its kind. So how are we doing? You know, even though you can do it, is it actually doing anything? So these are some data showing the CEST response imaging. So the yellow here is the high CEST signal. And what you can see here in a non-responder, that yellow signal is really persisting. But in the responder, so someone who's actually kind of the tumor biologically is getting more inert. It may not be shrinking, but but its actual metabolism is shutting down. You don't see as much yellow in there and you're starting to see different colors. And ultimately we're able to segregate a uh, non-responder in red from a responder in blue. And we're early on, but we're understanding this and we're getting better and better. Now, there are lots of different imaging out there, and if you do reading or if you're aware of this, one of the more mainstream ways of doing uh, image assessment is called perfusion imaging. So this is looking at the blood flow. And you can do this on many different MRIs. Even the lower strength MRI is not an issue because this is not as sophisticated in terms of looking at the cellular architecture. So we've published these data just very recently in Pejman Marlani, our expert neuroradiologist here at Sunnybrook, looked at the data on 38 patients that had gone through our process. Again, understanding all of the factors associated uh, with the tumor, including the surgical extent, but also the, the bio the molecular extent. So if you're MGMT positive, if you're IDH positive or IGH negative, these were all IDH negative and segregating into early progressors versus late progressors. So what did we find? Well, we found that using a very simplified model of understanding the blood flow through the tumor and the, the area surrounding the surgical site, we can actually predict response. So again, the theme here is trying to use advanced imaging to understand who is going to do better than not, because it's so important for our patients to have a realistic expectation of how they're going to do when we're talking about an incurable cancer. And there's some patients that are going to do better, and there's some patients that will not. And now we can help inform not only the patient, but the family and everybody so that they understand what's happening to their disease. And these are just some data showing that these metrics can actually segregate patients in terms of who we can expect may not live as long as somebody who may live really quite a longer period of time. So again, going back to the MR Linux now, again, remember this MRI is not the same, even it's a 1.5 Tesla MRI, but it's a different design because there's a radiation unit that's jammed in the middle of it. So we actually have to now go back and try and do these on the MR Linux. And this is how complicated it is. And this is why we're so dependent on grants and philanthropy and support. And we've had support also from the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada to perform these experiments and understand what we're doing. And I'm very happy to say that we've been able to do this on the MR Linux. And this is just an example of an advanced MRI map. So this is called multi-parametric imaging. 
So you can see we have the T1, a flare, a T1 map, T2 map, all of these different types of imaging that are really interrogating the tumor area that's resected, but also the region around the tumor, because we always have to treat a volume or area of the brain to try and kill as much microscopic disease that we can't see. And by doing this type of imaging, we may be able to see that microscopic disease that you couldn't otherwise because we're using advanced metabolic or, 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 or cellular imaging. And some of, the, uh, some of the challenges that we've had really run around time. And for many of you, I mean, going to an MRI is not pleasant for anybody, but you're talking about 45 minutes or an hour. And now you're telling me I got to go for radiation, but while I'm getting radiation, I've got 45 minutes of imaging. No, we're tailoring it that down. So this is an example of a process map. This is how we tailor the amount of imaging for just what you need and also develop or build in some research sequences so we can do better in the future. So overall, from start to finish, it is about 40 minutes. Now, on a standard uh, linear accelerator or radiation unit, you can come in now, in and out, with it in about five to 10 minutes. You know, it really is incredible the speed at which we can deliver radiation uh, with using normal, um, normal units. But with an MR linear accelerator, we're not there yet. It's still early. But what you get is the benefit of a daily MRI. And for a brain tumor patient, I would argue that that's extremely important because we are always looking at the tumor on MRI. There are other sites of disease where we don't use MRI almost ever, but now that is changing also, also as a result of the technology. Now, some of the really cool things that we're doing is also called a functional imaging. So we're actually testing the ability to determine what areas of the brain are active in different types of tumors, like a glioblastoma or a meningioma, and what's happening during that radiation. And do patients with a glioblastoma, is their connectivity in the brain different than say somebody with a meningioma or a benign tumor? And can we model that? Because say we could find areas of connectivity that matter that are in the radiation field, maybe I'll adapt the radiation field to save some of those areas of connectivity that could mean better function outcomes, say better thinking outcomes or better um, uh, processing outcomes in terms of brain function. So very early, but very interesting uh, data that we have been acquiring uh, as a result of the MR Linac. So how have we done thus far? Well, I'll tell you, we've done pretty good. We've done that. We've treated now 115 patients. 42 minutes is the average session time. Uh, and just in terms of the actual core time, it's about 22 minutes, but start to end about 42 minutes. And you can see here, there's a breakdown of all our imaging and it has been a very successful program. Now, we do this not only in terms of our, our research um, program, but we're sharing our data within that consortium. As I mentioned before, we were seven, one of seven in the world, and now we're sharing our data all together as part of the momentum study. So everybody goes on the Emerlinac because it's new, goes on a clinical trial, and we share that information. But what I'll show you here is this dash, uh, the, the blue line here, which is... Um, uh, uh, brain tumors, so the blue dotted line here, we're getting pretty high up to even lymph nodes or prostate cancer. As a result of our program, we are one of the dominant um, indications now being treated with the MRLinic. And why that's important is it pushes the field to develop it globally for patients with brain tumors so they can realize this technology. Otherwise, some tumors just get left out because people don't have the desire to develop the technology for the indication, but that's not what we do here. We are dedicated to brain tumor patients. So how are we going to get into the future? So we can treat and we're doing it in a standard way. We're learning, but, but our aim is to change the paradigm to make the treatment better for our patients. So there are different ways of dealing with this. So one is that, you know, we're seeing different changes in the brain. Sometimes we're seeing different tumors actually pop up in terms of glioblastoma, seeing other areas of the brain being affected that we wouldn't otherwise know. We can see a reduction in swelling or increase in swelling, and that can make, make us uh, change the dexamethasone. And for those of you who know, dexamethasone is always the drug we're trying to get you off of because it is good at uh, reducing swelling, but it has a lot of negative impacts in terms of how you feel and on the body physiology. And then there's the idea of putting it all together, getting that biologic information and really doing things smarter because we may not need to treat as much normal brain tissue. 
And there are some data looking at actually um, very active areas. So using some of that diffusion imaging or IVM imaging, and then finding out where is active and maybe actually hitting that area harder. And at University of Michigan, they've been doing it with standard MRIs, not necessarily changing it on a day-to-day. -day. So they're assuming the static nature of it, taking some MRIs during, the, during treatment, but hitting it very hard in selected areas. And this is really where, where we want to go, which is biologically informed tumor targeting. Now, at Stanford, what they did recently was they took a six-week course of radiation in very selective patients, and they cut it down to five days. And it is a huge departure when we do that, and that's called hypofractionated radiosurgery. I don't think necessarily it applies to all patients, and we have to be very careful in terms of how we did it, but we do that. But what's important here is that they reduce that margin to five millimeters, where we normally use 1.5 centimeters or 15 millimeters. So we are taking this this approach with the Michigan approach, and we want to do better. But first, we have to make sure we're all drawing the same because it requires international cooperation, and we standardize how we draw our volumes for radiation amongst the consortium. And Eric saying led this work, so that was an important first step in terms of consensus. And now we're trying to figure out also how the tumor spreads. And this is just some work where we're using advanced imaging known as radiomics to actually predict where the tumor is going to grow. And maybe that's an area that we also have to concentrate that extra radiation boost on. So this is work in development as well. And ultimately, we're talking about the UNITED trial. And this is unity-based MRLINAC guided adaptive radiotherapy for high-grade glioma. So it's a phase two clinical trial, which we hope to open in the next few months, 40 patients treating with either six weeks or three weeks if you're older than 65. And we'll have daily MR imaging with adaption using a five millimeter margin and using all that information to try and define as much of that volume that we need to include and include it and then adapting the radiation on a week to week basis so that we ensure that we're hitting the targets as much as we can. And ultimately where we will go is more refined volumes, but this is a first big step. And this is a major step uh, for the field. But we're not only about there in terms of one step further, we wanna go even further. And this is even further in the future. And this is where our focused ultrasound program comes in. So we are one of the first in the world or the first in the world to open the blood brain barrier with an MRI based device. And we're actually showing that we can get chemotherapy uh, into tumors that we could never do before in some patients with brain metastases. For example, in this case with um, breast cancer, we're seeing Herceptin now lighting up in the tumor, which we would not have otherwise penetrated. So very exciting work, which we ultimately want to bring to the, uh, to the paradigm of the six weeks of radiation, inducing some focused ultrasound, doing the MRLINAC as well, doing things smarter, and hopefully improving outcomes of survival. And we want people to live longer as a result of all of this technology and doing things better. So I would say in conclusion, there are huge applications for the MRLINAC and brain tumor patients. We can't be left out of novel technology as our mission is to make the standard of care treatment better for patients' life. The future is completely open to innovation. And I'm really hoping maybe next year, come back and show you that we were able to do at least the first major step in improving patients' life with advanced radiation technology. And with that, I would say thank you very much and hand it over to, back to Yeni. Thank you so much, Dr. Sagal. That was, as always, a very informative presentation. Can you remind me, as currently right now, Sunnybrook is the only hospital in Canada that has the MR LIMAC, correct? So there are a few hospitals that have it already, but okay. we are the only hospital actually treating brain tumor patients. We're actually probably only two in North America. There's uh, Madison, Wisconsin, but we are the brain tumor site for the global consortium. Okay. And so uh, somebody was asking from Quebec if there was a hospital in Quebec that had the equipment yet. Not yet. I know that they've been trying to uh, install one in Shum, but not yet. But there okay. are plans. There are plans, I believe. Okay, great. So I just have a few questions if you have a couple minutes. Sure. Um, so one person asked, would the MR LIDAC be effective for an inoperable grade two or three oligodendroglioma? Sure. The application of the technology is to any brain tumor. Now, the question is, would it change the prognosis by not operating? 
operating? And I would say, no, the first step is still a proper operation. Mm -hmm. The aim here is to make the radiation component of that treatment better. And it might. Right. Perfect. And um, is it available for recurring uh, glioblastoma? It is. I think you can. You yeah, so it that, is. Right? So, so our protocol right now is really in the upfront setting, not in the recurrent, because you don't need to use such big margins on the recurrent. And our aim is margin reduction. So when you don't need to have a big margin because you're dealing with a recurrent tumor, I wouldn't think that it's appropriate. And remember, you're going through 45 minutes a day. So we have right. to be careful. Right. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. I'm just looking at the other questions that came through. Um, it says to date, what stage of glioblastoma treatment is the MR Linux most successful and is the genetic makeup of the tumor important to its success? That's a great question. So we're certainly seeing uh, by day 10, a lot of changes that may allow us to do some adaption. Okay. By day 20, we're really understanding better who's going to respond and who's not. So the entire program is giving us a wealth of information. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, you know, we don't know yet, uh, in particular, when what's ideal, and we're, we're studying it. Mm -hmm. And the genetic makeup of it is is actually really interesting. Because on one hand, you could say that if you do have some of the favorable markers, you may benefit more because we're able to volume reduce and do things better. But also, if you have very aggressive tumor, we may be able to hit it harder and mm -hmm. give you that extra dose, which may matter. And so I think it's applicable to, to all patients with, uh, with brain tumors. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, another question that came through was um, just the comparison, comparing the MR Linac to the Gamma Knife uh, stereotactic, radio, stereotactic radio surgery. Perfect. Great question. So always, and this is a re recurring question, the gamma knife is really for metastases or small tumors where you only need to hit the target. In glioma, you need to treat a region of the brain. Now we're trying to reduce that region that needs to be irradiated, but it's not for a radiosurgery treatment. That's a, that can be used in the recurrence, but not in the upfront. Okay, perfect. And what about comparison to proton therapy? So proton therapy is very interesting. It doesn't use the same image guidance. So, so it doesn't, not an MR guidance. Mm -hmm. The real only advantage for proton radiotherapy is some of the low doses, which are not clinically consequential. There was a randomized phase two study done at the MD Anderson for glioblastoma that did not realize benefits for protons. And, and it's because you don't need it, you know, in, in that technology. There are some areas, but we can safely treat and with the same dose of radiation uh, as a proton unit. But here now we have MR guidance and now we're here, we're able to track and monitor the tumor and that may realize benefits rather than a very similar technology that's been around for a hundred years. So there are actually data that says not really applicable. Okay, perfect, thank you. Just looking through here. Um, how could this technology improve lesion identification for patients with MS and astrocytomas? So, oh, that's a really interesting question. Yeah. So I would say that, you know, I don't, so if somebody has a concurrent diagnosis of MS and a primary brain tumor, mm -hmm. we're pretty sure we know exactly where that tumor is. Mm -hmm. MS plaques look very different. So I wouldn't say that that is a necessarily an application, but just you need proper imaging mm -hmm. and you need a neuroradiologist to help you uh, delineate exactly where you want to treat because mm -hmm. uh, MS plaques are, are, are identifiable. I'm just curious, as of my co-presenter, can you see the questions as well? Uh, yes, I can. I'm just, I'm just curious yep, <laughs> just I can from see. a learning perspective. Um, so this one here um, is MR Linac for glioblastoma only or also used with meningioma patients too, which you mentioned before is glioma only. Right. So we're, we, do, we have done some meningiomas and we have done some tumors, uh, benign tumors, mm -hmm. uh, really while we were ramping up. But, you know, you don't see a lot of change. So mm -hmm. there are some critical meningiomas that are right near an organ at risk that I will do it for. Mm -hmm. But the main issue here is glioma because mm -hmm. the brain is changing and it's inflaming and it's contracting and, and we're, we're able to see that, which you wouldn't necessarily see with a, with a benign tumor. Mm hmm. Okay, perfect. And just a couple more questions here. I'm wondering if there's been work undertaken in the genomics area to help identify who might respond better to the treatment before embarking. 
Yeah, that's a wonderful. And so in collaboration with our surgical scientists, uh, it, we are actually interrogating with next generation sequencing uh, these patients that we put on the study. So we're hoping by doing next generation sequencing, we can actually give you that answer. And I'm hoping in about a year from now, we will be able to do that. Perfect. Thank you. And do you know quite yet what the um, criteria is going to be for that clinical trial or... So it's, it's newly diagnosed brain, uh, brain tumor patients who are elderly or um, younger. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, you know, in terms of our criteria and, you know, the philosophy of care, I would say that certainly our, um, our belief is that where the big gain is going to come in terms of survival is going to be with new drug therapies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have a new drug therapy, uh, then certainly we would want to try and make the radiation better. Mm -hmm. And that would be, this would be a very good alternative uh, clinical trial for newly diagnosed brain tumor patients. But I would still say that if there is a chance to get on a new drug and have that integrated into the care, that would be our priority number one, at least here at Sunnybrook. And then we look at uh, technological types of innovations to improve mm -hmm. care. Okay, perfect. And just one last question. I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but um, this person said that uh, they were diagnosed with a grade three anaplastic astrocytoma IDH mutant, diagnosed in April, 2020. Uh, this person was not offered the MR Linac um, from Princess Margaret Hospital at the time and the usual tradition radiation method was used. Just wondering why possibly they weren't offered the most, the more advanced treatment at Sunnybrook. Well, look, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, we're right now investigational. So it's all a clinical trial. So it's, uh, you know, the standard of care is still the standard of care until we prove that it's better. We can't say that it's better. You know, mm -hmm. we can only infer from what we're learning right now. Mm -hmm. Hopefully in the future, it does become the standard of care. And we do see centers using the technology for it mm -hmm. because we believe in it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, and somebody mentioned that they would like to make a donation directly to um, the project itself at Sunnybrook. So maybe you- Yeah, you can always get in touch with the Sunnybrook Foundation and they will certainly direct it uh, to the program. And you can always direct it to the Gore Downey uh, right. tumor program because you know James Perry and I treated him and it, mm -hmm. it, was, a, it was a phenomenal experience, uh, but one that we are very grateful for him to establish that brain tumor uh, uh, a foundation program within Sunnybrook. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Sagal. I think that's the majority of the questions. If anybody, if I, if I didn't get your question, my apologies, we're still kind of, uh, this new platform is new to us, but if I missed your question, just let me know in the chat and I can follow up uh, with Dr. Sagal via email with your question. Um, as always, Dr. Sagal, so great to see you. I miss uh, visiting you and the team at Sunnybrook Hospital and running up and down the halls with you guys and saying hello to everybody. So please say hello to everyone. Uh, maybe a virtual high five or virtual hug. We see that you're in your scrubs, so I'm sure that <laughs> you are ready to hit the ground running again this afternoon. So thank you. Uh, just know that there's over 100 people online with us today, and I'm sure they're all clapping for you and your presentation for your team and all the work that you're doing. So, and yes, we would be happy to have you back anytime for any updates down the road. So we're gonna switch over to Jody's presentation and um, thank you again, really appreciate it. Perfect. Okay, Jody, just give me a second here to get organized. Okay. Okay. Sorry, everyone, just give me a second here. Hi, Jody. Hi. Perfect. Arjun, if you can hear me, I'll just get you to turn your video off for us. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All righty. And before we get started with your presentation, I just want to do a quick announcement. Hmm. Where is what I need here? There we go. 
Okay, everybody. So before I introduce uh, Jody, I just wanted to uh, share this page. It's called The Power of Love. With Valentine's Day coming up in um, February, we have our own little fundraiser going on here where Bruce Power, who is one of our uh, national sponsors for many of our programs, is going to be um, matching gift dollar for dollar. And so what you can do is you can send an electronic Valentine's card to a family member, a friend, a loved one, um, somebody in your support group, maybe. And um, we're really encouraging people to, to, to come online with us and to send, share and spread the love, so to speak. And for your donation of $27 in honor of the 27 people that are diagnosed every single day, um, you can send love to someone who needs it on this Valentine's Day through these custom e-cards. And we're encouraging everybody to use the hashtag power of love 27. So you can learn more about this. I will include the link in the chat for everybody. And, um, and uh, yeah, we, we look forward to sharing lots of your love throughout the community. And so I'm going to pop, bring up your presentation here, um, Jody. And I'm going to get you introduced. So this is Jody, everybody. Hi, Jody. Hello. <laughs> Jody's joining us from Toronto as well, and is going to talk to us today about her being her diagnosis of a glioblastoma uh, last year. Um, and three things that Jody is grateful for that she shared with me is her family, her healthcare team, as well as her friends, and they've all been such a great support uh, to Jody throughout this uh, this experience. And Jody also shared with me that some things she likes to do for herself include exercise, but looks a little bit different now. Mm -hmm. That makes sense with I'm sure your energy levels right now going through treatment. You enjoy long walks and your and your yoga and that you're paying more attention to your spiritual self starting a meditation practice. And you mentioned that's quite hard to do. It is hard to do, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I keep, people keep telling me just try five, 10 minutes here and there. And that's what I've been doing myself. But it's it's, it's hard to get into, isn't it? Yes. Um, and you also mentioned that you are working with a Reiki and a soul coach, which I want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about that a little mm -hmm. later on. But um, I'm really I'm really curious about that soul coach. Um, okay, I will tell you about her. I had never heard of it. I had never heard of that. So we'll go ahead with what we had planned, right? We'll just kind of go through your slides and I'll go through them and ask you some questions. Sure, sounds great. great. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, so why don't we start a little bit, Jody, by telling us a little bit more about yourself, your, your family, kind of your life pre your diagnosis. Um, and yeah, just share a little bit about your, your personal Okay. So um, I have two young children, um, one born in 2015 in November, that's my son Jack, and the other one just born in um, August 2018. Um, and they have become <laughs> my whole entire world. Um, I Jack school, I was on all the committees running the Christmas socials or holiday socials and um, being in charge of the book fair and things like that. And uh, Claire was usually in a baby carrier on my chest doing all of these things. So it, it was a busy, happy life. And we had just returned from a vacation in Belize right before the pandemic start. We returned on March 8th. Um, so, uh, and right after that, I started having the headaches that um, just got worse and worse. Um, so my husband works in banking. He's a busy guy, downtown guy. And now he's been home for a year. So it's been uh, every aspect of our life has changed in every way possible. Like couldn't even imagine <laughs> last March that this would be what we're looking at coming into February, 2021. Sure. Sure. And what a beautiful family you have. Thank you. Cute, yeah. Cuties. Yeah. And you guys have two dogs? We do. They were our fur babies. They're mm -hmm. nine and 10 now. So <laughs> we've raised them and now they're old, old doggy men. Um, and uh, Claire is now two and a half and wow. Jack is just over five. And luckily they are in a program at the same facility that helps us kindergarten. So we have some of the only kids in Ontario that are in actual school. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Gives you a little bit of a break, right? Yes, it yeah. does. Good, good stuff. So um, maybe you can talk a little bit, a uh, little bit with us about some of the symptoms that you had leading up to your diagnosis, um, and, and yeah, and what that was like for you. 
Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, in the beginning of March, we were in Belize, like no issues with anything, feeling great, um, came back. And then as April started, I started getting more headaches. By May, I had contacted my uh, GP and asked to come in. She had me in for a neuro test there. It was, you know, push on the hands kind of thing. Um, and everything went fine. Uh, so she suggested I take a couple different extra vitamins that I wasn't already taking. And I went home and suffered through it getting worse and worse and worse and called her back and said, you know, this, I need something. What can we do? What's the next step? And she said, well, an MRI is the next step, but because it's COVID, we're probably looking at months long wait. I said, okay, well, put me on the list because I've never had one and this is getting unbearable. Mm -hmm. She called a few days later and said they had one for Tuesday at 10 a.m. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I'll be there. Um, and then so that was on June 30th. Okay. And then it was just a really long day in the ER that was lacking in information and quite confusing. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And scary. Yeah. And not knowing, not knowing what was going on and looking for, for answers. For sure. For sure. So Talk to us a little bit about that diagnosis and your standard of care kind of treatment plan um, that was set up for you. I sure. see here you've got, you had a goal and some things that you were trying to avoid. Yeah. So I'm trying to avoid having to have another surgery, getting this tumor to grow and have another resection. So that uh, picture is me wearing the little head patch before I was able to take it off and wash my hair. Um, and then the goal is just to spend as much time with my kids and my husband as possible and just to not let the petrifying fear of when it's going to grow, how fast it's going to grow, how the second round of treatment is going to grow, stop me from enjoying my time with them. Okay. That's, yeah. That's a good so. goal. Absolutely. It's a good goal. <laughs> so focus on the good. And, yeah. Yeah. So the standard of care, as Dr. Segel mentioned, uh, for glioblastoma is surgery, chemo, and mm -hmm. radiation. So maybe mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about the, your experience with your surgical resection. Sure. So when I went on the 30th of June, they had told me they'd found a lesion and um, that the lesion might be cancerous. And, uh, and so I'd had an extra scan with contrast and then another body scan to look for any uh, other cancer in my body. And fortunately, those ones came up clear. Um, and then I met a neurosurgeon for just a few moments who said he would have his admin call me on Wednesday to set up the surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and then John and I just went home and tried to digest what had just happened. And so I didn't know if it was cancer or not in my brain at that point but I knew it was a tumor that they said had to come out. Right. So we started looking um, for uh, another neurosurgeon because I because that one had actually gone on vacation. Right. <laughs> I didn't feel that I'd really gotten the, very much attention in the ER waiting room, mm -hmm. but we found Dr. Spears at St. Michael's and I went in on the Saturday morning. There was no available ERs um, or ORs at that time. And so I came back in on Sunday morning and had the surgery. Um, and I left 24 hours later. Uh, wow. It was a quick turnaround. Um, uh, but I was, they were only able to remove 50% of the tumor because they wanted to ensure that I didn't have speech deficits so close to my communication center. Mm -hmm. And the tumor material was sent for surgery or for um for pathology yep. yeah. and um, it was confirmed on my first meeting with Arjun and James Perry, Dr. James Perry, that it was in fact a GBM tumor and they had some extra pathology, um, useful pathology that it was a methylated one. So that's great for me. Mm -hmm. It picks up the chemo better than um, unmethylated tumors. Um, and I'm IDH wild type, which I haven't really figured out how that <laughs> plays into my uh, treatment plan at all. <laughs> okay. Well, and maybe um, if Arjun's still online, maybe he can uh, explain that yeah. to us after. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's, oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so Arjun, I, do you want to, do you have a second Arjun? To answer do you want question? me to explain that? So, yeah, sure. Why not? 
So the question is like what the implication of is the IDH wild type, is that it? Yeah. Okay, so you know, we the, the thing with the IDH marker is that you know we look for the very common mutations. Okay, so there's a wild type uh, and then there's a mutant. And with a mute, mutant IDH wild type, we know the prognosis is somewhat better than if you have a wild type. But the, the, the challenge in the way that we determine some of these mutations and why we're trying to get more and more into next generation sequencing is that these IDH wild type, there are other ones that we don't test for. They're more rare, but when someone does better than expected, even if they're IDH wild type, they probably have some of these other mutations. So we're getting a snapshot. It's not the whole story. And, and that's what we try and explain to people because it's sometimes disappointing if you're uh, an IDH uh, mutant. Uh, but with the MGMT, if you're methylated, that's also mm -hmm. a positive. So I think we're still in the genesis of understanding all of these molecular factors in terms of prognosis. Perfect, thanks Arj. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's talk a little bit about your experience with radiation and, and getting treatment on the MR Linac. Jody? Sure. Mm -hmm. So that is me in the mask that they make. They custom make a mask uh, when you go in for your first radiation planning um, meeting. And it's a, it's a sticky, soft plastic that opens itself up over your face to provide a really, really tight contour <laughs> to keep your head perfectly still. And you can see the piece of uh, scotch tape or whatever that's on it. That's where my tumor about is. So um, it's, uh, and it's six weeks. So yeah. it becomes your life. Yeah. Um, the first few weeks were smooth sailing. It was like just going in for an MRI, it had no extra effects, even, even with the uh, tumodal. Um, and I really became friends at the time with my radiation technologist. They're the same five or six people rotating through and I saw them every day and one of them I found out had had a baby the same day as me in Sunnybrook with Claire oh. so we shared a baby birthday and <laughs> we were somewhere on the same ward at the same time so that was really fun and uh, just like talking to them another one had a five-year-old so we talked a lot about things in common there they were they were all about my age um, and it made going there much more fun because it's COVID and it's super lonely without sure. your partners being yeah. able or a friend or a sister or somebody being able to come in, you know? So I found that it made it much more bearable for me. And then in the last weeks where I started to feel a little sick and then the last week, oh, <laughs> it felt yeah. terrible. Yeah. Um, but they, they really helped pet me up too. And they would tell me, you know, like, things look great on our imaging. And so I, I, I knew because I also did the baseline 10 day, 20 day MRIs that they were having a successful treatment and that it was picking up the chemotherapy and still shrinking. So that was, um, that was really what helped push me through because on the last day, just taking the, the, the chemo to go was, emotionally super trying because sure. <laughs> you just didn't want to do it anymore but I knew that it was working and so that's yeah that's what helped me get through that and then the month after that was a lot of time of rest it sort of had latent effects in trying to catch up yeah uh, it's kind of your body kind of cumulative cumulative mm -hmm. right with the radiation yeah. um, in the sense of when you start feeling the symptoms the side mm -hmm. effects I guess yeah um, so what was it like for you wearing that mask uh, I you, were there don't tips mind. Okay. So I like scuba diving. My husband and I did every vacation we could. Uh, we'll go scuba diving. So I don't have a claustrophobia effect. Um, I didn't mind it. Um, I see on the support group, some people really do uh, feel it's too confining and uh, don't like having their head snapped down. But yeah. again, when I went into that, I said a mantra every single day as after they snapped me in and put, and I tried to make it a space where um, I would either listen to the sounds of the MRI mm -hmm. or I would try and meditate. And I began to like notice patterns in the sounds of the MRI because it's a 45 minute process, as Archon said. And, uh, and you could hear the same, the sets of sounds. And, and so I knew where we were always at and stuff like that. So uh, it was a, 
overall not a bad experience for me, but if you are at all claustrophobic, you probably wouldn't like it. <laughs> fair. That is fair. Well, thank you for sharing that experience. And, you know, it must've been maybe a little bit of comforting to you getting to know the staff as well, mm-hmm. right? And just, it was. you know, making you feel a little bit more comfortable in the situation, especially like you said, with your husband not being able to, to be there during the pandemic. So, mm-hmm. so that's, that's nice to hear. Um, I've met many, many of the, the staff at Sunnybrook. So I know they're, they're all super awesome. Um, let's talk a little bit about your chemotherapy um, sure. uh, treatment as well. Sure. Yeah. So um, for me in the beginning, I didn't really have any side effects, but as you can see, this is about a month after radiation where pretty much a ring all the way around fell out and it's just you know, it happens to everyone. Um, uh, and it's slowly growing back in, but, um, other than that, that was my physical symptom. I didn't have any other physical symptoms. Um, I had a bit of a rash at the end, but that one that cleared up, but I've had crazy blood work pretty much ever since. So I've had kidney function with creatinine levels wavering, and I've had platelets and neutrophils wavering. So, um, even though I finished the six weeks in September on the 9th of September, and I was supposed to start my uh, adjuvant rounds of chemotherapy four weeks later, I've only been through two of the four rounds that I should have been through. Um, I've seen internal medicine specialists couldn't figure it out. And then a week later, the levels normalize. And then two weeks later, they drop again. So we don't have an answer for that but um, I'm handling the chemotherapy well in the adjuvant rounds. And my last um, MRI, which was on the 14th of December, shows that the radiation and chemotherapy are still continuing to cause shrinkage to my glioblastoma. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder to the audience as well, if you have a question for Jody, if you could please put it into the Q&A section as opposed to the chat section, because I really don't want to miss your questions. Um, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about how you're coping these days, Jody. And sure. um, I mean, it's a lot to handle as a young woman and as a, a mother and a wife yeah. and a friend and a family member. And, you know, so so how, how's it going these days for you? Um, well, physically, I feel really, really good. I have a walking partner, um, another mom from my uh, son's school and throughout the fall, we'd walk 10, 13 kilometers a day some days. Um, And so that was really nice. She's also um, knows everything about every park in the city. So she took me to a lot of places I've never been, which was really great. Um, And now Yoga is my other outlet for physical activity. Um, And before I used to do yoga more for power yoga style, but now it's much more um, yin style and uh, more thoughtful and slower. Um, But I don't feel that weak. If it's just my body weight I'm carrying, I feel fine. I can go all day, but I do notice it when I pick my kids up that sometimes my legs buckle and I, I really have lost a lot of uh, my strength, but I just, if it's just my own body weight, my endurance is where it always has been. So that's been really, really good. Um, and eating, I couldn't eat anything after radiation. We felt terrible. But once that month passed, I've now just like a really clean diet. Um, I've been using this, which is awesome if anybody doesn't have it and is, uh, has a partner going through um, any type of cancer. It's, it's got lots of wonderful um, immune boosting meals in it uh, that your kids will enjoy. And my son has decided he's a vegetarian. <laughs> so in the past month so we've been trying to incorporate that in and move meat out so for a while I contemplated a keto diet because a lot of people seem to be using them in the support group but uh you can't have a keto diet and have a vegetarian diet because then all you'd be eating I think is kale right (laughs) so so, (laughs) no it's not it's not very well balanced so (laughs) (laughs) Um, and then, uh, so emotionally, um, I haven't 
told my kids much about it. I mean, my daughter's only two. Sure. My son knows that I have cancer, but we don't know nothing else about it. Mm -hmm. And just that I go to the hospital to get my blood checked on Mondays. And um, they, my son struggles with it a bit. I find him gazing off into space and then asking about what heaven's like. So it's okay. tough. Um, but we, and, and I let him watch the Disney soul movie over the holidays. And he was so upset because that was not his idea of heaven. So we oh. had to shut that off immediately. <laughs> um, but uh, emotionally, I think I do pretty well. I would rather look at it as something to be solved rather than something to um, just accept. So mm -hmm. my husband and I have been doing a ton of reading on things we can do nutritionally for me. Um, we, I am in part of the, the um, glioblastoma, two different support groups online through Facebook, as well as mm -hmm. the uh, Brain Tumor Foundation one. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's tons of information and like-minded stories and it's really nice to know that uh home for a year in covid that we're just not the only the only ones you know covid's been a blessing in the disguise because yeah. i would have been home a ton anyway but i've had to be extra extra careful because i've had a weaker immune system yeah. um but it also means that i haven't seen so many people who have reached out i've had such a wonderful amount of support mm -hmm. when i first got diagnosed i don't even know how it got through the grapevine but we ran out of flat spaces to put vases of flowers on <laughs> and uh, lots of people dropped off lots of baking and yeah. meals and lots things like that issues, yeah <laughs> yeah i've been trying to try to keep like a sticker tape on each one so i knew where they went back to so it's just you know it's not been a hard time really it's been a bit of a beautiful time and because i'm responding so well to the treatments because I know that my tumor is shrinking and I am eating well and playing with my kids, I do really feel like it has been a time of hope and that that the COVID aspect of it that has maybe made it more lonely has actually given our family the time to digest it properly and well, really make good memories. That's a beautiful perspective, Jody, and it's a really great lens for you to kind of, you know, for you to focus on, right? And for your family mm -hmm. to focus on. So tell me, tell, tell us a little bit more about the soul coach. I'm really okay. curious. So uh, this woman I know, JLE, she um, does soul coaching. And what that means is that she is a channel for okay. um, helping you unravel like past life trauma is how she how it works. And so I've done a couple of sessions with her. Uh, she was my Reiki coach first. Um, and uh, I found the Reiki, I went into it quite skeptically to be quite honest. And uh, I found that it moved something emotionally in me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I did the, the soul coaching with her and she, you know, it's a variety of different things. It's, she's got cards that, that um, like tarot cards kind of thing, but different. And then there's a gene key and she takes a bunch of information from your life and links it to a gene key. And all of this is super unscientific, Arjun. <laughs> but uh, but it's helped given me a little bit of peace because I'm not a religious person. And uh, I've had to think a lot more about my spirituality and what that means now, you know, like I, uh, and so without, you know, picking up all the tenets of an organized religion, I've been mm -hmm. able to find some sort of spiritual peace in that. And um, it was through the Reiki practice that she was, that she had the inclination to, um, or was being guided to help me establish a mantra. And it yeah. was. Yeah, and uh, and I said it every day. It was oh my pod my own, and it means that um, I'm making the right decisions for me. Mm -hmm. And it's probably comforting, right? Regardless if it's yeah. you know scientifically proven or anything like that, it brings comfort yeah. to you at this time in your life, and that I think is really important. Yeah, so you've got good days and you got bad days. So you have a picture mm -hmm. here of what kind of a good day looks like and what a bad mm -hmm. day looks like, which is yeah. Here. Um, so tell us a little bit about some of your tips and suggestions for family, for friends, for healthcare professionals. We've got two, two slides here, but, um, we'll get you to 
Yeah, tell us a little bit more sure. about that. So, well, one thing is that if you're doing this during COVID and your loved one can't be there, your doctors will most likely be fine with you recording the phone call or looping them in on FaceTime so that they can hear it. It's too much information to take in by yourself. Um, I got so much of the initial meeting with Dr. Perry and Dr. Sagal wrong <laughs> and had to go back and listen to it. So that was, uh, yeah. So like, don't be afraid to stop and slow it down. These guys have these conversations every day, so they understand what they're saying and maybe you don't, and you can't make an informed decision unless you're actually understanding what they're telling you. So yeah slow them down because <laughs> they talk fast all of them dr Especially spears talks guy. fast yeah <laughs> our dr sagel talks fast mm -hmm. um and uh and join uh if you're ready join one of the brain tumor survivor sites mm -hmm. or glioblastoma but also wait till you're ready because you will see people have passed away and their caregivers will let you know on the site almost like several people a day sometimes and it can be emotionally draining. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're ready, <laughs> there's way more great information and support than there is death and sadness, but you're gonna get both. And I think that it's important to, you know, start to understand that there are what your other options are too if you weren't <laughs> sure if you wanted to be part of a clinical trial or things like that you can even sometimes ask people do on these sites like is anybody part of this trial how's it going for you you know get extra information from someone directly in it it's kind of useful mm -hmm. um, but um, just research too and don't take the average life expectancies mm -hmm. of 14.7 months is all you have you know if you respond well there are people five seven ten years down the line if you don't respond well that those are the people that unfortunately like lower the overall median survival mm -hmm. for everyone so and and you've no reason not to think with the literature out there that they can't find something mm -hmm. that'll work for you if it's not the MRI LINAC or if it's not Tomodal, maybe it's a vast and maybe it's something else maybe it's the Mars a bomb trial trial at Princess Margaret you know there's lots of great resources to avail yourself from and it feels like everything is out of control that you have no control over this mm -hmm. so that's why I recommend just working on your diet and a bit of exercise because those are things you can control. And if you can keep your immune system from dumping out on you after the six weeks of radiation and chemo, then, you know, you're just gonna, you're gonna respond better emotionally, physically, and mm -hmm. hopefully to the treatment as well. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. And you did mention already, Jody, that there's some of the support groups that you've been yeah, participating in. I'm in all so three of those. Here. Yeah. And I look at all of them every day. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, maybe, so maybe any, maybe I'll just say one thing about yeah, that, that part of it. I just say that, you know, one of the exciting areas in terms of some of the developments in particular on the recurrence is a, a trial mm -hmm. scheme called GBM Agile. And mm -hmm. what it is, is it's there to try and introduce a lot of new drugs quickly because it's, it's mm -hmm. realized that we need to do something. And we're very fortunate. James Perry is the North American uh, PI for the study here at Sunnybrook. So we've been, we've been heavily engaged in this process and I'm really hopeful that it's going to bring new agents very quickly to the clinic for people with recurrence in particular. So it, it is an exciting development. It's mm -hmm. perfect. Thanks, Serge. Um, Jody, there's a couple of questions and comments that have come up here, if you don't mind um, sure. answering. Uh, one comment is that somebody said that they have a friend of over 50, a 15 year survivor friend. That's um, awesome. Yeah, so that's great. Um, this person said, not so much a question, but a comment. What a brave woman you are, Jody. I admire you. You've handled and continue to handle its life, uh, to handle life's big curveballs. You embody strength and courage as a mom of two young ones as well. I am in awe of your attitude and unwavering dedication to your family as you continue on your journey. Thank you for sharing your story. You're gonna make me cry. Um, that sounds like you. it was planted by my mom. No, <laughs> Who wrote it's, that? It's, it's not, <laughs> I know this person. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Um, um, Arj, do, you, do, you have, Arjun, do you have a time for one more question? Actually, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but somebody was asking maybe your your um, thoughts around the keto diet. I don't know if you. I mean. So what, what I, what I um, tell patients and just exactly what Jody said is that, you know, if you find a diet that makes you feel good and makes you um, happier and, and more energetic, then go for it. But, you know, you have to be careful because there's nothing that you can eat or drink that can affect the cancer. It's all about how you feel, mm -hmm. but you do have to be careful about taking excessive supplements. There was some data that were presented that looked at patients overall with cancer who took a a lot of excess supplements, so like very high doses, say of vitamins, mm -hmm. and they actually did worse, you know, right. with their cancer treatment. So, so be careful, use common sense, find something that makes your body feel good and stick with it, you know, and yeah. that's my advice. Yeah. And that's definitely something that we say at Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada is one, speak to your healthcare team about any supplements that you might want to take. You want to make sure that they don't contraindicate with the medications that you're taking for the treatment. Um, question for you, Jody. Um, did you have any other health issues before your diagnosis of a GBM? Any family history of any type of cancer? Nope, <laughs> no. No, I was uh, running healthily, um, worked out at the gym four or five days a week. You know, my parents don't have any issues. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, okay. came you. out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So that's, um, I would say all the questions for Jody. There are a few other questions that may have popped up that I will loop through and look through and loop you in our gen via email. If there's anything else that we need um, some questions answered for. So thank you to the both of you so, so much for um, joining us today. Um, I know your husband is there. Jody, does he want to do a wave? Hi. <laughs> Thanks for, thanks for thanks for joining us as well. Um, do my hair. <laughs> um, I just want to let everybody know that tomorrow uh, we are launching the registration for the brain tumor walk this year. I say brain tumor walk as singular because we're not hosting any virtual uh, any in person walks this year because of the pandemic, but we are hosting a virtual brain tumor walk that. Uh, will be happening this spring so please watch out on our on our website for more information about that and um i think that's it for now so thank you again jody and dr sagel for joining us today and i'll let you know if there's any other questions that come th that came through from from the audience anything else you want to add jody to finish off? no thank you for having me you're it's welcome nice to see you thank you thank, thank you thank you thank you guys take care everybody okay bye-bye